Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bible study. Let's get right into Bible study tonight and let's pray and believe that the Spirit of God will help us. Did you know that over 250 people were watching last week and uh, then through the week others joined us? So we welcome you all and pray that God will speak to all of our hearts, your heart, my heart. And as our pastor used to say, Pastor Harry Luke, some of you might even remember him, that godly, wonderful, father-like figure that was such a nurturing help to me in my early years. He used to say, Lord Jesus, give me something from your heart to my heart to flow through to the people's hearts. And that's our prayer right now. Father, just as he prayed, we pray as well. So Lord, bless this study in a remarkable way. Let it go into all the world, into the far reaches of the world, even into this troubled world where there is so much upheaval. Bless your word, multiply it like you did the loaves and the fishes so many years ago. Father, we pray, multiply your word, send it. Lord, we want to see the word of God go forth and cover the world, cover the nations as the waters cover the sea. And that is your word and that's what we pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. People ask me, have I heard much about uh, what's happening in the Ukraine? Well, I have, even in the last five minutes. Uh, one of our pastors was shot at by uh, the invading troops and uh, all the tires of his van were uh, shot at and successfully, so all the air went out of them and he was just stationed there, didn't want to travel any further on the rims of his, on his van. And um, I don't know where he was going or where he was fleeing from. And then the, um, they fired again and it went through the windscreen. And uh, fortunately and thankfully he wasn't wounded or shattered with the glass or anything like that and he's rejoicing. I don't understand much in the way of Ukrainian or Russian uh, in the language, but I understood when I listened to the, uh, the video, he was praising the Lord. So we praise God with him for his preservation. Now tonight, I want to talk to you, um, quite frankly, as you would hope and as I would expect to, to speak about uh, the antidote to the fear that's in many people's hearts and lives. I believe we should be a careful people, a resolute people, a people that are walking circumspectly and uh, looking ahead and knowing where we're going, know what's happening around us and uh, taking uh, everything uh, in our stride. I don't think for one moment we need to be fearful. The Bible says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, you believe also in me. And so we have his word, we have the assurance of his promises. And uh, we live in a very precarious world. And I'm not only speaking about Ukraine and uh, those that are suffering the violence of invasion, but uh, we, we live in a world that's um, smitten with the need to be aggressive and to overcome enemies by violence, force, pressure and other means. So uh, we're subject to that and there's a spirit in all of that. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. I want to read you a scripture that I believe the Holy Spirit dropped into my heart about two days ago or three. I received an email from a very dear friend and a friend of many, many years who was uh, suggesting that they were very afraid of not only COVID, but even the vaccinations. And they saw things that were both sinister in that. And, and the more that I read the email and uh, pondered it and took it seriously and sincerely, I thought to myself, there's an element of fear here. And I speak to a lot of people 
Uh, as a pastor, as an interested person, I talk to people. I find that there's a growing uh, anxiety in people's hearts and minds. And then the other day, just as I was prayerfully considering these things, I believe the Holy Spirit dropped this word into my heart, which I'm going to share and expand and expound tonight. It's found in the 22nd chapter of the book of Proverbs, and it's the 13th verse. And then it's almost word for word repeated in the 26th chapter. But let me read it to you. The sluggard, the person who does nothing, says, there is a lion outside. I will be murdered in the streets. And then as we go across to the 26th chapter, that is virtually repeated. This time, let's have a look where it is. Chapter 26, and uh, we read here a very interesting uh, statement again. It says that the sluggard, the man that is brought to a standstill, who is not doing anything, and this is in verse 13 again, there is a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. What is that indicating? What is it saying? It's virtually saying, I can't go out. I'm in a lockdown situation by my own choice. I'm not going to move outside of my home because if I get outside, I become vulnerable and there's a lion that is roaring, a lion that is roaming, a lion that's going around and seeking whom he may devour. So therefore, everything that I would have done, places I would have visited, actions I would have been taking, I've put a, uh, an absolute standstill to them. Now, are we unwise to expose ourselves to things that perhaps are dangerous? Well, we would be if we were just uh, uh, totally disregarding of those things. But, uh, and there is a scripture here that God spoke to Israel and he said to Israel, go my people, this is chapter 26 of Isaiah and verse uh, 20, go my people and enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed upon her. She will conceal her slain no longer. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 and verse 21. So there's a balance there. There are times when we do withdraw and we seek the Lord and we find his mind in things, but we need never be in that paralytic fear that takes over people's lives. And I see it taking over people's lives. And yet Jesus said that in the end times, here in Matthew's gospel, that this would be what would happen? Uh, people would be fearful. And the Bible says when there are wars and rumors of wars, see that you not be not alarmed. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. God's not sanctioning it, but he's letting us know it will happen. There will be famines, there'll be earthquakes, and all these are the beginning of birth pangs. You, thinking of believers and uh, directing this statement uh, to believers, you will be handed over to be persecuted, put to death, hated by all nations because of me. 
And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. The Bible goes on to say very, very strongly that there will be distress in those days. Very, very interesting. The Bible goes on to say many things about that. And of course, in Luke's gospel, chapter 28, uh, 21, we have a very graphic illustration and uh, it speaks here of the turbulence that we are getting to almost take for granted today. And what is it? Well, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then again, he talks about the famines, the earthquakes, and then he adds pestilences like COVID, widespread worldwide pestilences. Very interesting, isn't it? And here Jesus says that the waves of the sea will roar and there will be chaos. In fact, we find that further down in verse 24. There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars, and on the earth nations will be in anguish, and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Now, it's not talking about the natural sea. It's talking about the sea of humanity. And then it goes on to say men will faint. Men will faint. They will collapse from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now we have in the Old Testament, in the prophets, and then again in Hebrews, and here in Luke chapter 21, the prophecy of this great shaking that will take place in the world. And what it will do, it will dismay people. It will frighten people. I would choose personally not so much to be frightened and afraid, but I would seek to use this time to be on my guard, to be on my watch, to find out what God is saying and how God is directing me personally, my family, my church, and through the church of Jesus Christ to the nations of the world. Now, there is a lion in the streets. That's interesting to me. It sort of touched me along this line when I was reminded of the first epistle of Peter and the last chapter of the first uh, epistle. And we find here Jesus' words are being repeated by, by Peter. He says, be self-controlled. Now, how can you be self-controlled? Well, the preceding verse, chapter 5 and verse 7 says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let's stop there. I guess you know 1 Peter 5, 7. That's been a favorite of mine since I was probably about 15. I saw that very graphically. And I was in a situation where I had anxiety and I was very reactive, uh, an emotional young man and something had happened and uh, wasn't pleasant. And this scripture spoke to me and it gave me a tremendous insight when I was a teenager. Cast all your anxiety, your agitation, the upheaval of your emotions, your negative emotions, cast, which is a deliberate act, all of it on him because he cares 
for you. Now that word care means comprehensively he protects, provides, and will bless. So we have three aspects in the caring of, of our God. One is protection. One is, the second is provision. And the third is prosperity. He will prosper us. He will bless us and he will accompany us through the situation so that we need not have any fear. And then it's uh, from verse 7 that we listen and we hear, be self-controlled. Now, sometimes you've just got to do what the scripture says, and that is gird up the loins of your mind, just like you pull the reins of a horse to direct it, to control it, to stop it, or to cause it to go forward. You've got to draw up the reins of your mind and be sober. And here he's saying exactly as the apostle said, be self-controlled and alert because, now get this, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Can I say something to you? When you are full of anxiety, you are at your most vulnerable. When you have thrown your confidence out the door or it's fled from you because your fear has been greater than your trust and your rest in him, you're vulnerable. And like a roaring lion, when he sees you at that vulnerable point, he will say, aha, we have a cowering victim and he will leap upon you. But we're told to resist him. Verse 9, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. When we look around at lives, and I do repeatedly and probably daily, I'm talking to people who I care for very deeply and uh, am involved by their invitation into their lives. I, I see that many have been confronted and have been assaulted by the enemy. Uh, yes, a lion is in the streets and they have felt the terrible paralysis momentarily, perhaps, but they felt the paralysis of fear as the enemy has seized upon them in their vulnerability. Now, what does he seek to do? Well, we know that he seeks to... Uh, tame us, to bring us under his control. He wants to contain us, to tame us, to bind us, to bring us down and confine us so that we become inactive. And when you are governed by fear and look out the window and say, oh, there's a lion out in the streets, so I'm, I'm not going to go outside, I'm not going to make myself vulnerable, while that's common sense to a degree, you become imprisoned in your circumstances and you can't be that way. We are not to be tamed, it's the lion that's to be tamed. If you go to a circus, well, of yesteryear anyway, not so much today, they used to have the performing lions. And I remember a child, as a child, sitting in the, uh, the tent and watching these lions, these massive, you know, the king of the beasts, being tamed by an often small little man that if the lion left on him, he'd be gone. And uh, the secret was that the lion tamer had to be in control. He would flick his whip. He would hold up his hand. He would sometimes have a, a, a chair that he would go forward and the lion would realize with intimidation that the lion tamer was the boss. But if that lion tamer showed any degree of weakness, 
the lion would capitalize on it and leap towards the lion tamer and he would be gone. Now the enemy, when he is unrestrained and not tamed by the wonderful means that God has given us to tame him, to, to, to discipline him, to confine him, if he isn't so confined, then he will seek to tame us. He will seek to tempt us. He will pour all kinds of abuse upon us, tempting us to fear, tempting us to sin, tempting us to maybe react in some way so that we are indulging our fear and becoming more complicated, more inhibited, and more bound all the time. One thing the enemy does, because you'll remember here in First uh, Peter chapter 5, that he is like a roaring lion. It's the roar of the lion that intimidates. What does he say? Well, he abuses God, he abuses you, he highlights who you are and what you haven't gotten, who you're not and what you haven't been able to achieve. He'll bring up everything that's negative and there'll always be an element of truth in it. There'll always be something that he brings up that you can say, well, yeah, well, actually that's true. And he's got you because you see, Satan's lies are truth with a twist. He will ensnare you by logic. And then when you begin to think, as did Eve, as did Adam in the garden, well, yes, and you begin to become, in an earthly way, logical, you're drifting away from the centrality of the Word of God. So he will say something that gets your attention, that arouses a pang within you, and you think, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then he starts heaping additional things onto that, and then that truth is submerged by a heap of lies. And ultimately, you've lost your peace, you've lost your intimacy with God, you've lost your trust in God, and you are in his snare. So he seeks to temper your life, your commitment, your righteousness, your walk of holiness, he will attack that. He will tame you. He will tempt you. He will then taunt you. He will try you. He'll pressure you. The more weak you are, the more he'll heap pressure upon you. And then you will feel exactly like the sluggard. You are not doing anything. You can't go anywhere. You're fearful. You're bound. You're cooped up. And he's got you where he wants you to be. And then he will just romp all over you. He will trash you and everything that you have in God, he will destroy it, he will defile it, he will bring you to a place where you are just living perpetually traumatized and terrified. Terrified of, of the devil, terrified of what's happening, terrified of darkness. And according to what we read before in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, your heart will begin to collapse. Your faith will implode and you will be desperately afraid because of those things that you see coming upon the earth. So anxiety fueled by unbelief, fueled by resentment, fueled by the words of, of the treacherous one has brought you down and you become immobilized 
and he becomes triumphant. So we get this place where, uh, and so many are like it, where they are fearful all the time and they will begin to distrust the church, they will mistrust pastors, they will gossip about people in the church, they will undermine your confidence in the things of God, the people of God, and ultimately, God himself. That's the whole strategy. That's the agenda of hell. It's to confine and to bind you. And that lion will walk around the parameters of where you dwell. He will walk around your circumstances. He'll walk around your situation. He'll walk around and walk around and roar and roar and roar and intimidate and scoff and do everything he can to bring you into bondage. And you become a sluggard. You become a person that's no longer watching, waiting or working for the Lord. What he will also do, <clears throat> he will, in his roaring, trivialize the eternal. He will torment you with signs rather than have you using those signs to build yourself up in faith, your holy faith, and expectation of the Lord's return. You know, these people that are governed by and afraid of the conspiracy theories that are just about everywhere, that's all they talk about. They don't talk about the second coming. They don't talk about the glorious kingdom. They don't talk about evangelism. They're not out and about serving the Lord. They're talking about governments, 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 governments. They're talking about the false church, the false church false prophets, everything negative. What are they doing about evangelism? Well, tell me, how many souls did they win? Tell me, when do they talk about the return of the Lord? They don't. They're talking about the darkness and they're absorbed in darkness, not in the kingdom of light. So Satan is causing them and us, if we're not careful, to trivialize the glorious return of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, when you see these things happening, look up for your redemption draws near. He didn't say look down. He didn't say look into the dark side and the evil things that may or may not be happening. He says, look up, your redemption draws near. Now, the actions and the activities and the assaults of the enemy are basically to subvert. What did Jesus say? What was the great commandment to the church? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It is, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow those that believe. You see, I know it off by heart. You see, this is the passion of my heart, to go, to speak, to pray, to see deliverance in people's lives. That's my passion. I hope it's yours. It's the prayer of my heart. It's why, why in three weeks' time we will be boarding a plane about this time and flying to London where we'll be preaching or sharing in churches and then we'll be going on to Poland. And from Poland we will go up to the border of Ukraine and Poland to where humanitarian work is taking place. Our wonderful friend, uh, Victor, who's probably watching uh, tonight, God bless you, Victor, uh, he will take us up there. And uh, we need your prayers. We know that there are dangers there. We know that it'll be overwhelming. 
and we are praying very much and seeking God about this. We want to come back and share with you and the people of uh, central New South Wales. We're coming down there uh, probably in June to talk about what we've seen and how we as a blessed people in Australia can bless our brothers and sisters across the sea. But you see, we want to go. We want to go to preach in churches. We want to go and encourage the workers. We want to go and learn. We want to hear the voice of the Spirit. We want to be attuned to what God is saying and doing. Our eyes aren't just on bombs and bodies and the treachery of one man and uh, the way he's pulling his nation into a, a state of war. We know that. But our desire is to know the Word of God, what God is saying, what God is doing, and what God is wanting at this very hour. Now, the enemy would try and subvert that. He doesn't want the church preaching the gospel. He wants the church to be caught up with itself. He wants the church to be caught up with fear. He wants the church to be caught up with all kinds of rubbish, things that are not relevant to the return of his son. So he is seeking with his roaring and roaming on our streets. He is seeking to subvert, to soil the church, to weaken the resolve of the church. He is seeking to undermine the commitment of the church of Jesus. And I'm not talking about one denomination as opposed to another. I'm talking about the whole body of Christ, irrespective of denomination. All those that love the Lord, love the Word of God, believe the Scriptures, believe the Word of God. He's wanting them to take their eyes off this book and get their eyes on the problem, on the signs, on the different things that are going on so that they will not preach the gospel. And thus we will become soiled we will become defiled and we will become enslaved because of his work within us. Now, <clears throat> the agencies of the enemy, the agencies, what does God use? Well, there are three principal uh, agencies that God uses that we read in the scriptures. And then there is the one behind it all. Did I say that God uses? I mean the enemy uses. The enemy appears in three guises, and maybe four, maybe more. One is the serpent that is subtle. The second is the dragon that is, oh, overwhelmingly fearsome. Then there's the lion that roars and is like a lion, but if you penetrate that bravado in the name of Jesus and through the blood of the Lamb and the confidence and assurance and authority of the Word of God, you'll see that roar dissipate and he will deflate. But of course, he also manifests himself as an angel of light. And we read about that in the book of Corinthians, the second book of Corinthians particularly. So these are the ways he appears. But then he uses, and there is a, a typology here, or shall I say more correctly, illustrative aspects of those that he uses. First is the strong man, the Goliath-like image, the one that looks all powerful, the one that looks so despotic, he's a giant in the land and formidable, 
like a huge granite mountain beating a heart of steel and hatred and confidence and a voice that roars. The strong man. You fall into the trap. You fall into the hands of the strong man. You are bound. You ask any man or woman that is bound with alcoholism or maybe with drugs and drug addiction, a problem with any sin that has seemingly being controllable at the beginning then takes over their lives. They know they're in the grip of a strong man. And then the Bible talks about the stronghold. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says we live in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. Our battle is spiritual. And we have that, of course, in Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 10 starts that portion about the armor of God. Not only the armor, but the weaponry that God has given us. And he starts by saying in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's a magnificent book, the book of Ephesians. And God speaks strongly about the strongholds. And they normally control our thinking. And I'll tell you what, you can't argue a person out of an opinion that has come through bitter experience and consolidated negativity. For years, they've built on this negative structure and reaction, and they feed on it, they draw upon it, they talk about it. And I tell you what, you might as well walk away because the only thing that can break that stronghold is the Word of God anointed by the Spirit of God. So the stronghold is commandeered and guarded by the strong man. But there's a third entity, and it's the strange woman. And we come to meet her in a very illustrative way in Proverbs chapter 7. She is termed there as an adulteress, for that's what she is. And it says, to a young, hapless, vulnerable, innocent foolish, naive young man, she comes. And then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10. She's loud. She's overwhelming. She's defiant. She's rebellious. Her feet never stay at home. No, because she has an agenda. And her agenda is to bring people down to the grave. Verse 27. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. In fact, the psalmist says that these are the pits or the pit. You know, we have a grave where all of us will be laid if Jesus tarries and we die, we go to the grave. That's our physical body. But then the Bible talks in addition to that, to the pit. And the pit is the terrible terrible place, not of the dead, but the damned. Now we call that hell, the place of the living dead, the place of eternal judgment. And this seductress has one desire, one plan, one objective, and it's to take the innocent and to defile him, 
to arouse him, to bring him under her control, and then she delivers him to the stronghold superintended by the strong man and these three unholy beings and place are the places where the damned exist. Now, this is the prison house that Isaiah 61 speaks about, to open prison doors and to set the captives free. Hallelujah. That's what God can do. All right, as we come to a close, we know now with a very, very clear uh, itemization that the enemy is that lion out in the streets trying to intimidate you and bind you and to keep you subverted, to keep you inoperative, to keep you paralyzed. All right, well, <laughs> what's the solution? Well, the solution is to stand in the victory that Jesus won at the cross. And when we turn to these glorious pages that we would have contemplated in the last few days, I'm sure, being Easter, we will be reminded of the wonderful things that happened on the day of Jesus' crucifixion and then culminating in the resurrection. Do you remember that as you read through the narrative over the Easter period, that when Jesus cried, it is finished, he said, it is complete. The price for man's redemption has been paid in full. And then he gave up his ghost. He released his spirit to the Father, and he died. And at that precise time, over in the temple, in the holiest of all, the curtain was rent from top to bottom. Matthew talks about it, and of course John talks about it. The disciples were captivated because they knew that this was indicative of this wonderful breakthrough that God gave through Jesus, by Jesus, to each and every one of us, that we might enter the presence of God, that we might have intimate relationship with God, that we might be forgiven, that we might be called sons of God. And of course, that's what John writes about a lot in his wonderful epistle. He says here in 1 John chapter 3, I think this is wonderful. How great is the love of the Father that has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. We're no longer children of the devil. We're not children of darkness. We're not children of defeat. We are children of God. 1 John 3, 1. Romans 5 says we've been reconciled. Romans 8, 1 says there is no condemnation. We're walking now after the spirit, not after the flesh. So we are no longer subject to the roaring of the lion, however loud, however accusative, however strong, however demanding, however threatening. You don't have to cower. You don't have to become indolent. You don't have to become inoperative because you're cowering indoors saying, we can't do anything, we can't go anywhere, we're frightened to death of the devil. We're not. We have a wonderful, wonderful confidence. And to know that, you should read at your leisure First John. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
So the enemy may be great and operative in the world and shattering lives and torturing minds and breaking down people's lives, but you and I are free. And I was reading the other day in this wonderful scripture in John's Gospel that says, and you shall know the truth. You shall know the truth. Not academically alone, that's important. Not intellectually alone, but spiritually by revelation, you know the truth and the truth sets you free. There's a day coming when there'll be the absence of the enemy. The enemy will no longer be anywhere to trouble mankind. And we will see that day when he is cast with the unbelieving. Sadly, the unbelieving are unnecessarily in the lake of fire. But he and his angels of rebellion... Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 and Revelation chapter 20, 21 and 22 are cast into that lake of fire and this smoke goes up forever and ever. He won't be around. And I thought it was rather quaint and cute when someone said, when the devil starts talking about your past, and highlights about your life. You just talk to him about his future. Cut off, never to be redeemed, never to be rescued, never to be cleansed, never to be forgiven, whereas we're all of that. We are washed, we are sanctified, and we are right with God. So I caution you not to be overly burdened about what's happening in the world, but rather be set free to serve the Lord with the knowledge of his word, the knowledge of his will, and the knowledge of the fact that he is returning very soon. And he wants a church that is without spot and wrinkle. He wants a church that is watching, a church that is waiting, and a church that is working. Are you part of that church? God bless you, and I trust you'll be with us on Sunday. We're going to talk, I think, on Sunday about the passions of Jesus. Oh, yes. He was a man a man of remarkable passion. Now, Elijah was a man of like passions as we. But Jesus, he had a passionate heart, but without sin. You know, our passions are not always wrong, but it's the sin that defiles them. So next Sunday, we'll be talking about that in our church at the worship center. And you're free to tune in and to be part of that service. God bless you, dear, precious friends. And remember, let's get going for God. Let's serve the Lord with gladness. Let's preach the gospel. Let's make disciples. Let's give of our substance and let us see God do great and wondrous things. Well, on behalf of Abilio, on behalf of my dear wife, and on behalf of Jasper, who's been very sleepy tonight and neither under the table or at my side like last week, he's over in his bed, thankfully not snoring. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you. And do be active in the work of the Lord. Amen. You look gorgeous, boy.